Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the session about children's data rights. We are having a few seconds for people to uh, come in and uh, uh, we will start. All right, I think at least boxes stopped uh, popping off. So I guess uh, most of us are here already. And we have too much to talk today to lose any time. So my name is uh, Paula Bello. I'm a lead together with Dixon for the uh, My Data group uh, dedicated to children's uh, digital rights. And I'm uh, together with Pulsen Wuller from uh, the uh, literacy the thematic group that she is so kind to join us, even if she's in bed <laughs> with COVID. Uh, uh, she wants to say hi to uh, explain a bit about literacy groups. So I give the floor to Gulshan and then I will tell you a couple of things about our group. Gulshan, welcome. Hey everyone, I'm really sorry to be off camera, but um, COVID is very real, it's still out there, so please be careful. Um, so my name is Gushen, as Paul introduced, I'm one of the um, co-founders of my data literacy thematic group. Um, and today's session is, is very, very um, related to our group, as, as my data literacy group really, really, really do explore the topics of what does it mean to be data literate, but from a, a specific context of my data literacy, and how we can do it in a way that is not gatekeeping, that is not, we're not leaving other people outside that's normally um, tend to be a place outside of this conversation so we really have this inclusive mindset um, and today's session is is something really close to my heart uh, my data for children uh, I, I have a, a background in social work and uh, I sadly explored uh, ex experienced many many sad cases with young people and their struggles online um, so today's session has a very special place in my heart and we are very happy to support the efforts um, as, as my data literacy group, and we're looking forward to um, seeing what will uh, what will come up as as a, as, as outcomes of, of these conversations. So I'm really looking forward to the session, and thank you, Paolo, for managing this whole thing. Thank you, Wilson. Get well soon. Uh, so my data for children actually has grown very organic. It was. Uh, we post in uh, the same conference, was it last year or two years ago, this question that what, what does my data mean for children? I just po posted a question in one group and then Dixon within five minutes have created a Slack a, 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 a room. And then we started to talk, people that we share both the, the, the passion for what the uh, my data approach can do for services and also the concerns of what can go wrong. So uh, my data for children, objective is to not only protect children, but empower and inspire them to thrive in the digital world. And this mission, when we talk about children, we also talk about parents, guardians, and their circle of trust. When we talk about children, it's not only the children, but it's a, a ecosystem of persons and systems working together for them. So from that perspective, we are born. Uh, we have a fantastic group of people today. I'm so excited because uh, we're going to be hearing, maybe for the first time live, the story behind Mixit, which is the first My Data operator for children. So we have the, 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 the mothers, the fathers, uh, the aunts, and everyone here today to tell us how it was built. Uh, we have uh, Katrina, though, who of course, she's a legend at uh, My Data, founder of uh, Amico. They will each introduce themselves when it's their chance to tell their part of the story, but I just give an introduction now. We have uh, Gabi Pereira, who is the mother of uh, uh, Mixit. I forget your official title, but I think this is what we focus on today, the mother of Mixit. We have Eric Van Acker from uh, uh, Gabi and Eric are from Heather. It's an association that they will both explain what they are working with children and, and, uh, and uh, uh, people with uh, different capabilities. We have also a, a special guest from UNICEF, our old friend Steven Bonslow, that he's going to help us navigate the questions about policy. Thank you, uh, uh, Steven, and hi to all our friends in UNICEF. 
And we have, of course, uh, Gulshen and Dixon. Dixon, everybody knows, he's going to be helping us moderating uh, the chat today. But before we go further, we wanted to share, uh, uh, Gulshen and I, uh, a video to summarize probably the most extreme and, and, and uh, impactful case in, in the last year. Uh, uh, we want to share this story in case you don't know it, but this is why we are here today. So, Dixon, if you can play the video about Molly, please. This 14-year-old girl, described by her family as thoughtful and caring, took her own life five years ago. But in a landmark conclusion, the cause of death recorded by the coroner was not suicide. Instead, he stated, Molly Rose Russell died from an act of self-harm whilst suffering from depression and the negative effects of online content. He said the platform's algorithms romanticised acts of self-harm, normalised her condition, and that some content discouraged discussion with those who may have been able to help ultimately contributing to her death. If this demented trail of life-sucking content was safe, my daughter Molly would probably still be alive. It's time to protect our innocent young people instead of allowing platforms to prioritise their profits by monetizing the misery of young people. Those platforms have today responded. Meta, who own Instagram, told Sky News, we're committed to ensuring that Instagram is a positive experience for everyone, particularly teenagers. And Pinterest said, we've invested in building new technologies that automatically identify and take action on self-harm content. Most of the hundreds of posts shown in court are too distressing to broadcast, but essentially glorified suicide. The inquest heard how one email she received from Pinterest was headed 10 depression pins you might like, accompanied with a picture of a razor blade. And Molly isn't the only one. Alicia Cowie was 13 when she started self-harming after algorithms on Instagram introduced her to it. I didn't need to know what suicide was or how to do it properly <laughs> um, because that was just feeding into the fact that I wanted to do it. And maybe if I didn't see these images... I wouldn't have even thought about it. Children's charities say this verdict should send shockwaves through Silicon Valley, already preparing itself for how the government's online safety bill should impose stricter measures on protecting users from harmful content or mean they face fines. The question is whether or not this inquest might actually be more effective in triggering action, opening the floodgates of people launching litigation against the big tech firms for mental health conditions. The coroner very sensitively um, put social media platforms in the place today and said it's not good enough that this contributes to people's death. But there's hope here as well. Have conversations with your kids. Have conversations with each other about how to engage with young people to protect them from the harm on and offline. For those who loved her, it's been the longest of journeys. Thank you, Molly, for being my daughter. For the Russell family, this marks a moment of closure in their battle to expose the dangers of social media. In Molly's death was the greatest of warnings. And in this verdict for big tech was the most damning of judgments. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Thank you, uh, Dixon. Uh, Katrina, can you <laughs> please tell us now, why are you here? It's very hard, uh, Paula, after seeing that video and um, the courage of that family to, to really decide to take action. And I, I, I see a couple of words there, romanticised or, or the suggestive nature or the fact that content is being pushed. So, so why are we here? I mean, it's terrible that this is happening to teenagers but it's more concerning that a lot of these habits and the addictive nature and the compulsion from a digital space starts much much younger and without the right protections it starts at a time um, early in life that magic period sort of zero to seven where children are just forming and exploring and creating a place in the world. And so 
one of the concerns that, that I have from a data point of view, an algorithmic point of view, is we're only just starting to understand over the last decade the significant impact on children as a result of the social media platforms and kids being able to have access. We're now starting to see these long-term studies and the harm. And so the reason we're here today is really to celebrate the amazing work um, uh, and, and the vision from Gabby and Eric and the team at HEDA in bringing something like Mix It to Life, which aims to create a beautiful digital playground and a safe space for children, free of algorithms, free of any of those external nudges as a means of a child having an interactive digital life, but not at the cost of their life. And I think that's, we'll explore that. Um, I'd like to hand the floor over uh, to, to, to Gabby and Eric to, to dive in, and then maybe we can talk about some of the policy things. But the one thing I would like to say is the video we just watched, that happens and will continue to happen unless we take action to put the right safety mechanisms, design mechanisms and architecture in place to protect children. We can't take digital away. I mean, we live a digital life. We're physical and digital. It's a fact of life. But we can create safe, empowering, playful digital environments that actually help and support a child's development, particularly when they have their first digital experiences. And that's really what we want to talk about in this session today. Great. Thank you, Katrina. So let's pass uh, uh, the ball to uh, Gabby. Gabby, can you introduce uh, yourself and tell us about what was the starting point? What, what problem are you set out to solve or what are what do you see that your children, the children under your care, uh, need and you did this? Yes. Okay, I'll do my best for that as mother of Mixit. <laughs> Hello, mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, so I'm Gabby. I work in Heater. Um, a little um, thing on the side. It's an, it's an organization in Belgium, in the province of Antwerp, uh, for people with diverse disabilities. And I like, Paula, to hear you say with uh, diverse uh, capabilities, because that's all, also how we um, really want to see people. And I think it's really nice in Heater that we always start to look for people's strengths and their interests and their aspirations in life from the very beginning, from a very young age, that's very um, uh, important to look at. And um, yeah, in this in this whole scene of HEDER, I focused for the past 18 years on the youngest children and their families and networks, so children from zero to six. And I think it's often my job to bring back people to the perspective of a child because it's so easily gets lost and, and, and adults take over and they are um, they want to think about children but they um, uh, forget to really uh, see their perspective and how they are um, experiencing the world and opening up and what's scary to them and what's joyful to them. So that's really important that we try to understand children and, and feel what they are needing in life. And I think that's what we were looking for just because um, in our field we Every day we, we see so much energy coming together around children and it starts from children's power that they have on their own. They're very creative in handling the world and overcoming difficulties. But it's also very powerful to see how many caregivers are uniting around young children. And then I think about parents and grandparents and, 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 and other family members, but also teachers and, and, and daycare workers and therapists sometimes. So a lot of people are joining forces because they really care about uh, children and their development. So there's so much going on every day that is important to children and that holds a lot of ingredients um, that's valuable. And we really wanted to find a way um, to, to highlight this and capture this uh, and find a digital tool for children that can empower them and that can give them, them an experience that, uh, that what they are uh, looking for in life, that they can actually find this also in a digital um, environment. So that's, th I think, what we were looking for, yeah. <laughs> So how did you make this connection of, of what you know you could see as in a way a simplified way their needs on the physical world how the digital world should support what was the link and how it come to something as concrete as mix it yeah so we see that children if they are uh, 
digitally uh, if they if they go digital they are always looking for things that lean uh, that ver are very close to what they are experiencing and uh, find interesting in daily life so there's a big connection there um, and I think we saw a, a big uh, opportunity in technology and, and, and working with personal media because this can really capture what's important to children. This can really show um, what they are enjoying and why they are enjoying things. And it helps them to re-experience moments that are important to them. So we try, um, I think, um, to make the connection and give children an environment that, uh, yes, safe in the first place it needs to be very safe it needs to be protected um but it's also a place that is inviting to them and is, is meaningful to them and it's really um like trina says a, a digital playground where they can actually wander on their own and they can play and they they learn along the way um but i think it's important that we create an environment environment like that for children but we need um to make it to keep it safe and to make sure that it's um, uh, protected and personalized and then we were looking for uh, we had this application for children but we also needed uh, an application for for adults uh, for administrators at their, their trusted circle like you say um, people that know children that that see how they develop and, and what they are interested in and this is at Admin application is really a way of, of setting up a meaningful environment to children uh, where it's possible to connect a trusted network around each child and make sure that meaningful is content, meaningful content can, can go to children, that it's really quality, um, qualitative, that uh, the thing they are they are watching, receiving digitally. So that's the connection we try to make there, I think. Yeah. The thing you can walk us through makes it show us. What it does. Yes. Um, um, Dixon, I think you have a little demo prepared. You can wait a minute to, to bring it up. I, I think I like to, to set the scene a little bit uh, and first say thank you to Maria and Imani for Miko for creating this uh, demo. Um, it'll show you uh, a little impression on, on the admin application and the kids application. Um, and first, we have a look on uh, how um, kids' profiles can be created, how media can be uploaded and shared. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we uh, see a contact um, being connected. And then we go to the, the, the kids' application, where, Dixon, you can pause uh, at, at that time when we see the, the kids' app coming up. So now we'll take a look at uh, the admin app. You can go. So you'll see here after you create uh, your own account as a per as a parent, you can create kids accounts, kids profiles. You see one coming up and the other. So and after, if you are connected to more than one child, you can group children, which is a handy functionality to share media to multiple children. Um, you can see this happening here. So two kids are connected here in the group, like, like this. And now we see how media can be uploaded and shared, which is a very fun process. Uh, three pictures are uploaded here, but it's fun because you can add uh, audio, which is important to children, or a little symbol or, or text. And then after you upload media, you can share it with one or more uh, child. And here an impression on connecting a contact, someone from trusted network of a child. So when an invitation is made and it's accepted here. And then if it's, yeah, Dixon, you can pause for a minute. Thank you. Um, then if, after the connection is made and the contact is in, in this um, admin application, then you can connect it to a child. So it's always um, um, protected like this. So now we'll take a look at the kids application. If you would uh, do this in real life, you'll see, uh, wait a minute, Dixon, you'll see um, 
kids' profiles, which is important to them, that they have their own profile, of course. And then if you uh, enter, you see the main screen. We will, also, we'll, we will see this in the demo. And um, we will also see the functionalities and how this media experience can begin. So now we'll take a look. So we enter the main screen here. And with the bar below, children can sort on files. So this is the photo, audio section, a little game we call the magic tiles. And the face button below is used to shuffle or mix the media. So here the child uh, selects photos. And then you get this screen and a little media bar when the children, where the children can um, choose differently. So it's easy as this and very fun. And this is your very first mix it impression maybe so i'll invite you all to uh, take a closer look and really use this with children <laughs> thank you Thanks so much Latin. do you want to add something more before we uh, uh, move to eric so he can tell us about uh the importance of developing mix it yeah i would just like to add that i really think this tool is very important because it can actually give children the lead. It gives them a tool um, to interact with. It's created for them. And they can actually show us what they like in life, what they need in life. And that's really, that's what we want to achieve. And we want to empower children and give them a way to show us what they need and, and that we are um, inspired by this and that we can work um, around their preferences and, and, and needs as well. So that's what I like to add. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I think it's so important also to help the children lead because if I have learned something these last years is that children are really smart. And we just have to listen, observe, and let them have the means to communicate what they see, what they want, what their interest, and also what they fear. So th thank you so much, Gabi, uh, uh, for this. Uh, Eric, can you tell us now from, from your uh, perspective the importance of developing Mixit and especially bringing it to the market so that it would really have a, a, a wider use than, than uh, uh, your work at Heather? Okay, I think it's, um, it's, I will start with a personal experience when I, st I have a background in banking, started at Heater, visited a group. Uh, there was a young boy about 13, physically 13, mentally maybe two, three years old, and he was somewhat absent from what was going on within the group. Um, one of the colleagues gave him papers with pictures and he, 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 he lit up. He, he he so much enjoyed the pictures of of, uh, of of his parents, of his sister, of his family. He was going through the pages, and even when he saw that I was watching him, he started to use these pictures to communicate. He couldn't speak, but he started to point out, and so I understood that the baby, the picture of the baby, was the baby of his sister, and he was really. Yeah, he was he was changing. He was he was he was full of joy just working with these with these pictures uh, in his own time and 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 whatever. Um, and so I think a month later, Gabi entered my office and, and said, uh, "Look, Eric, uh, since two thousand and whatever seven, eight, fourteen, I don't know, uh, uh, we have this idea of creating an application uh, just to to what." Gabi just described, and and um, I had the joy of that boy still on my mind. So I said, "Yes, we've we've, we've just got to do this." And then there were some qualitative reviews, uh, and we saw the same thing. If children used prototypes, uh, they were really enthusiastic in in working with the material and the media that were. Um, proposed to them. So that's the reason. Uh, and, and the second thing was then, okay, um, this is valuable. Let's just do it. Let's jump and, and we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens afterwards. But this is too important not to, to go on with and just to, to, to uh, keep it in a drawer. We have to create something that's, um, that allows children to enjoy their environment and to, en to enjoy their own world. That's the reason. And how, how did you move from that, from those first ideas and prototypes to what it is today? How did you find Nico and how was the kind of the development process? Yeah. 
Um, so first, we we had some some exercises on our own, some prototyping how it could look like uh, paper based. Uh, then we came into contact with Trent Wolves, which was a, a market research office, because we. Of course, there's the emotion and what we saw and what we felt, but there's also, of course, had the numbers and, and reality and, and, and uh, the the numbers. Um, so we asked Trent Wolves to help us with a qualitative assessment. Again, it was very convinc convincing uh, when we saw how the children reacted and second fan, second to that, how how parents and grandparents reacted on the on the prototypes. Uh, Trent Wolves at that time was very keen on the security and was really stressing that if we are working with young children, that it should be secure. And, and they were also very much aware of uh, yeah, the vulnerability of children when they go to this open world wide web. And, and for us, it was very, uh, although we're technically not, uh, have no experience in that field, but it felt really... Uh, close to us because, of course, we are working with vulnerable, often with vulnerable children and adults. So protecting and at the same time giving opportunities to these people, to young children, but also within uh, a secure environment is, is yeah very natural to us. So we said, yes, okay, let's work on these two legs: one world of the child and 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 let allow the, the child to 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 enjoy its own world uh, and at the same time keep it secure. Uh, and Trent Wolves then introduced Miko and it happened that Miko had worked for a bank I had been working for 20 years. So I called my colleagues, my former colleagues in the bank said, what do you know about Miko? Uh, they were very happy with Miko. So we said, okay, let's call Miko. We called Miko, we met Katrina. <laughs> Uh, Katrina also was very much from the beginning very enthusiastic about this combination. Uh, these two legs we call them uh, the the digital playground on the one hand, but the security on the other hand. Uh, and we started to build uh, a sort of uh, phased uh, approach, where in a first phase we agreed to create Mixit to invest both in it and uh, to start working from there. Um, and then once introduced and once alive, uh, we'll see in the second phase how we would uh, go on. Um, so it's a mutual partnership based on the enthusiasm for Mixit, I would say. Wonderful. And, and, and how, how, what happened after that? How did you start to, to move from the idea and the paper prototypes into very concrete uh, uh, design process? <laughs> By, by, uh, <laughs> I would say, sorry, Katrina, by a normal software development as we know it. <laughs> because, of course, you know, because it, there's the enthusiasm, there's the ideas, there's this, uh, we've, we've been focusing on the prototyping and, and what, what's for the children, but at the same time, there's the administration, there's the security layers, there's uh, the, all that has to be developed. And then, of course, there's, yeah, you have to make it tangible. So you go into a software development process of going forward, uh, creating specifications, uh, planning, uh, mandates, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how we proceed. But I think um, the difference, if I compare it with other software developments in, in banking, I think was the enthusiasm of, of everyone involved in, 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 get it, in getting this thing uh, into the world. That's, that's, that, was, uh, that was really lovely to see. But again, uh, Paula, it's, uh, I would say... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how do you build applications? Well, like in software <laughs> development, I would say. <laughs> but my question was more that you came completely from the user perspective, without yes. not understanding that you know the the, the 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 machine to make that happen, the backstage, and yes, then you were an expert in that. So, so, so I'm interested in this, which I think is the idea of matchmaking, having a very clear idea why are we doing this what is the value how is this going to change the life of people and then how are we going to build it this is kind of the lesson that i want to uh, learn from you for all the people that are in one shoe or the other today listening to us i think many are going to be in the shoes of uh, 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 miko and katrina and uh, i want to highlight the importance 
of understanding the user and especially the uh, user in this case that it's not it's a child special category itself but how it is not only the child but all the circle uh, 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 supporting him or her yes absolutely and and of course that um we Gabi and colleagues were very well aware of, of the experience of the child and the developers of Meek, of course, had their knowledge and their experience. But the fact that all involved believed in this in this end product, um, yeah, created the necessary energy for a software developer to explain for the third time what he was actually doing from a technical point of view. And for Gabi and the colleagues for the third time, maybe to explain from a from a child development point of view, why this or that button or color was important, yes or no. But it's the fact that everybody believed in the product made that process um, yeah, uh, feasible, I would say. Absolutely. Great. Uh, Eric, uh, uh, the, the, in a way, my next connection, is, I, I would like to hear the same perspective from Katrina, but do you want something else that you want to add now? To me? Um, no, I'm very happy that we are where we are, <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy that we have the chance to uh, to introduce Mixit to to a large audience, and and I hope that uh, uh, we get a lot of uh, reactions and questions and curiosity um, uh, to get this thing going. Great. So, That's Katrina, <laughs> now tell your side of the story. Well, I, I think the, the first thing I want to say is just how full of joy and how emotional I am when I see this video and I, and I hear Gabby and Eric describing the process because for me it, it, it still feels like that very first meeting, the very first time I heard Gabby describe her vision. And, you know, as Eric has described the fact that he's come from a banking background, our underlying technology, our platform, the very same security architecture that powers applications in the bank is exactly the same engine that sits under Mixit. Um, and so our focus has always been, how do you put that foundation down? But what really inspires me is when people like Gabby and Eric, organizations like HEDA come along and say, okay, this is our dream. This is our vision. This is what we would like. We would like to take that that strong, safe, secure, private by design foundation. And then we would like to create, you know, this amazing digital world. So I, I, even though I've been involved in the entire process, when I see this being shared and I see this video, it still just fills me with so much joy because it's so beautiful because what's different about Mixit compared to YouTube for kids or anything else is, a grandma can read a bedtime story and record it and send it to parents, even if she's on the other side of the world. And, and instead of a child, you know, being on YouTube with up next, some algorithm deciding that, this is a child listening to their grandmother's voice or reliving a family vacation or seeing pictures of themselves playing in the sun or building a sandcastle. And we forget as we move into the digital world, we forget many of those very grounding physical experiences, the feel of sunlight, um, the feel of sand, um, the smell of grass, the sound of a loved one's voice. How do, we, how do we bring those beautiful sensory experiences together? And so for us, we had some technical challenges. Children these days have high expectations. Um, of streaming, of Netflix, of all sorts of things with games. And so we had to try and find ways to make sure that the data encryption could respond to give us all the security we wanted, but also the speed and download that a child might be experienced if they were playing with the game. So there were, there were some really interesting technical challenges. The other thing that we had to solve was delegations. Gabby talked about this circle of trust. Um, you know, we know for some families that circle of trust might be split across multiple households. You may have children that live between um, uh, two sets of parents or may go into care with other family members. So we needed to think about, you know, how do we make sure that we give these delegation rights, you know, to be able to 
delegate some some ability to handle that media to a caregiver or a teacher or grandma for the day or if two parents are living in different places how do they share that so I mean that's a whole other um, uh, session if people are interested in encryption and streaming and delegation um, but the reason to say that is that we had really good use cases that made us test that and and as Gabby's explained we realized very quickly in the design process if we made if we made one app we would rob the child of that sort of digital freedom and, and the, the playfulness um, because we'd have the administrative things. And if we made the administrative part of it too childlike, we might minimise the importance of the administration in terms of that circle of trust. So in the end, we decided to build sort of like the, the circle of trust remote control and then the digital playground. And I think that's what's... that's. Mm -hmm. So powerful, but that also had lots of challenges, you know. As Eric said, software development, software development. It wasn't one, it was two times everything. And what was the dance between those things? So from our perspective, it forced us to think about a lot of things um, uh, in terms of usability through the eyes that Gabby was describing for a family. Um, and at the same time, as, as Eric know, coming from the bank, how do we make sure that we're never putting a family in or their data or their images or their content? You know, we're never making a, a position where they're um, digitally uh, vulnerable. Yeah. So it was a it was an interesting set of challenges. Yeah. Thank you, Katrina. And um, maybe now we can give the floor to Stephen because he has some questions about uh, policy uh, for you. Go ahead, Stephen. Thanks, Paula. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Foster, a digital policy specialist at UNICEF. Please excuse my voice. I've also had a bit of a flu this week. Um, firstly, congratulations. This is such a cool app and so amazing and so um, thoughtfully designed. Um, so, Katrina, you know, I, I work in policy, uh, the intersection of children, their digital lives and policy. Um, and I wanted to ask you for, for, for Mixit itself, you know, there is a policy and regulatory environment in which any app or service gets developed. Uh, obviously, being in Europe, you, 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 yours is a, a richer environment than, than, than others. So I wanted to ask about which policies or regulations you had in mind for this app and you had to kind of comply with and how you went about that. Was it, was it challenging um, or, yeah, just some of any, any lessons you can share from that, please? I, you know, Stephen, I wish it was challenging. I really <laughs> wish. Because that would have said that there was some criteria that we needed to reconcile against. And I think that's the most concerning thing. You know, I would invite everyone to, to visit the Mixit website because one of the things we said is, you know, no tracking, no tracing, no algorithms, no content without, um, you know, circle of trust guidance. And I think what was missing for us is either a... a digital bill of rights or a children's bill of rights or even a best practice set of policies that said, okay, if you're building something for a child at a formative age, you know, these are the do's and these are the don'ts. And, and, and that isn't to say there isn't great work. I know there's been some fantastic policy work done in the UK in the last year. I know that the US have just announced um, a, number of bill, uh, a number of bills around design um, and design principles for children. I, but at the same time, I heard on the news this week that and I'm, I, I don't want to say which tech giant, I don't want to get it wrong, but yet again, they were able to detect that some astronomical percentage of the platform are children under 13 who, surprise, surprise, lied about their age. You know, so, so you know, it's silly for us to not expect children to be children. And if they can, if they know, if I say, well, if I say I'm nine, I'm not allowed to play with this thing. But if I say I'm 19, I am allowed. And so I think one of the problems was we, we wanted to, we wanted to be able to say, even if a policy was introduced tomorrow, could we design this in a way where we would be really confident? So when, when we submit um, the apps to the app store, you know, what are you tracking? We're not. What are you doing with the data? We're not collecting it. You know, uh, you know, who reads the data? We don't read it. And so I think we, we've built this 
in the hope that there will be policies that might test the product in the future. I mean, that, that would really be would really be my dream. Wow. Okay. Well, that's <clears throat> not many apps can say that uh, with, with, with that kind of confidence. So, <laughs> so what I'm, one of my questions, I think you've, 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 you've answered was um, what, what kind of support would you have appreciated or developers in your shoes? But you've, you've kind of begun to answer that. It sounds like you're looking for more practical recommendations and practical guidance on how to apply policies or regulations and really think, get down. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think one of the difficulties is, and, and I, I don't know the easy answer to this, because um, kids will be kids, uh, and, this, and, and children today are born into this digital world, so they're very digitally literate very quickly. Um, age gating, I think, is probably the most significant problem that we have. You know, even, you know, Molly, even the video that we started out with, you know, the kind of content she was seeing as a young teenage girl, maybe that, and, and I understand uh, uh, people involved with that case, including the psychologists that re re reviewed the material, said that you would need to be very emotionally resilient, even as an adult, to have um, managed that content on a daily basis. So I think the real challenge we have right now is we don't have sufficient age gating we don't have sufficient mechanisms, and I think the large platforms are being misleading. They can tell, you know, if the bank can tell that it's me by the way I pick up my phone and walk down the street, these big social platforms can tell whether or not it's a child behaving in a certain way versus an adult. So I think we don't have enough uh, protections around those crossover periods of life. So then we have this content leakage. We have adult content being served up to teenagers. We have teenage content being served up to young children when they're starting out in school. And we have young development content in the hands of babies. You know, in a shopping centre, you see a child with a phone and they're watching something on YouTube. And so finding a way for us to have this digital appropriateness without sounding like we're judgmental and we decide these things but but in the physical world we were able to do that by the books we purchased or the play groups that children were in we don't have that digital equivalent yeah it's like yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. everyone is all in the same space and i think that is part of the harm okay thank you katrina thank you for that i i, I appreciate that and in the interest of time i'm going to hand back to to paula um thank you <laughs> Thank you, Stephen and, and, and Katrina. I think we can, we have a couple of uh, or three questions in the uh, section. Uh, the first one from Dixon is mix it open source. Uh, it's not open source uh, because uh, of a couple of reasons. One, the underlying platform is is actually built on the the Miko platform. We've talked about whether or not. Um, it might be possible to build mid modules in the future. And, and as Eric said, um, you know, where we go next is really going to be formed by the, the feedback and the, and the response uh, response to the, uh, to the product. However, unlike proprietary platform, um, what is very open is the way that you're able to manage the, the content and, and basically how how you determine really what is in that platform. So unlike social media platforms where that is being served up, it is at, it's actually the opposite. On the open source question, we should have that discussion in another forum because there are some things we're looking at in terms of our tech stack right now that we're, we're actually evaluating from an open source point of view. I'd yeah. say we're in the place. <laughs> Uh, uh, two more questions. So, so if uh, just very quick answers, because before we go, I want everyone to give in one sentence what you want people to take away. But I think these are very important questions. Has any consideration for interaction with education institutes been considered? Maybe that's uh, towards Heather. Yes, um, I want to to say to that. Um, that for the moment, and mix it started more maybe like a, a family application. So it has the possibility to interact with teachers and, and therapists, but not on an institutional um, 
um, uh, level or, or how do I say it? But I think, uh, Eric, uh, Katrina, we are always um, also had this option in mind. So how could we work together from Mixit um, with institutions? Because that's really a value, of course. But what we really want to, to keep uh, protected is that Mixit can follow the child. So it's not dependent of, of, of that it can be used in this institution and not in the other one. So if we want to, to make that connection, how can we make sure that it, it can follow the child and the network and the trusted circle? That's something we are really considering um, and it's important as well, yeah. Yeah, as it fo like follow him in the in or her in the life rather than the other and way. And you can around. combine and you can invite daycare, uh, t uh, schools, therapists, so that you can combine all these institutions uh, around uh, children, not only schools. Huh? Yeah. Hey, I'm sorry, we have to miss the last question, but Piru, we will get a response to you. Uh, I just want now that the speakers if tell in one sentence what do you want people to remember after this session. What have you learned or what do you recommend others wanted to do something like this? And we can start with Agabi. Yeah, yeah, I, of course, I would recommend to use uh, a tool like Mixit because it's really empowering to children. It's not manipulating them or directing them in a certain way. Um, so it's really a good tool that they can actually show us and take the lead for themselves. So that's what I uh, really would recommend to empower children in this way. Yeah. Thank you. Eric. Um, in uh, 1984, there was a band called Van Halen. I don't know whether you know <laughs> the band. <laughs> and they had a song and it was called Jump. I uh, invite you all to uh, listen to Jump uh, this evening. Uh, and that's, that's I think, uh, in a non-profit sometimes, surely in Belgium, we're somewhat sometimes somewhat conservative and, and, and uh, risk averse, et cetera, et cetera. But I just would say, and what I've learned is if you really feel that this is a good thing to do and it has a societal benefit and it benefits the children, then I would say just jump. Voila. Thank you. <laughs> Katrina? Um, I see a comment on, on the, 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 the chat that said, you know, no matter how you push parental controls, they're worthless if a child can sign out and create a new account with no limits. And what I would like to say is that's only true if you don't think of the design process and you see those two things as being part of the harm and you say, here's a safe space. If the child logs out, they need a parent to log them back in and that other part is separate. So the architecture of how we build safe spaces for children is as much up for us to be challenging each other about as as the content itself so we we can think about safe spaces for children we can design safe spaces for children thank you katrina and uh steven sorry thank you no i'm just <clears throat> i just love the fact that you know katrina can say and all of you can say you know when you're uploading the app you don't track the children you don't collect the data um, it's just a reminder that there is an alternative way to build apps and there's an alternative approach to design them. Um, so thank you for that. We, um, yeah, it's a, it's a message we need to keep pushing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, now uh, Gulshen has a surprise because she has been working on a resource list. Uh, Gulshen, do you want to briefly introduce? Uh, yes, um, so that was great to listen to and uh, thank you very much for everyone to share this expertise and I think this is a brilliant case study and really there is hope. It's amazing to hear that. And um, so this, uh, uh, when, when we were planning this session, we really wanted to end with a hopeful note and really um, when... Uh, Based on the Molly case, I've been talking to parents, guardians, uh, people who are working with children. And sometimes as experts, we tend to kind of close ourselves into expert circles and not really, you know, uh, be in touch with people, especially if you're focusing on data or tech, kind of that perspective. So it was also, you know, great to have Gabby here as, as, a, as a person who's working in the field. Um, but sadly, many people I talk to, they feel really hopeless. They feel despair they feel like they cannot do anything um, and they want just something very concrete to to guide them 
Uh, yes, there are millions of videos, probably minutes of people talking, expert, explaining topics, but they don't really have the uh, time to listen and understand the whole ecosystem. But so it's, it's really about finding that balance where we can really help them find and be guidance, but not overwhelming them by the complexity of the problem. So it, it's, a, it's a very delicate balance to catch. So in, in the resource list, uh, the, that was the, the aim actually. So to show that, yes, this is a systemic problem. Yes, you need to understand that some regulation, some policy has to be in, in, in place for to protect uh, citizens. <coughs> Um, but also, as, as, as of today, you can learn more. You can really take action. Your children can look at uh, some resources there um, and you can share it with people um, to really, you know, from uh, revisiting your privacy settings to really understanding how an algorithm works on a very basic level. So it, the, the actions and the learning resources really change um, and vary, vary uh, from levels, but really to show that it is a systemic problem, you can write to your MPs, uh, politically you can join some campaigns to really, you know, demand that safe space, but that doesn't mean you are. Um, ho- we are hopeless, and we cannot change anything starting today. Uh, so there are some very um, beautiful re- resources there, and it's a, it's a live one. So you can always add there more resources if you see benefit for the community. You can share it with people you like. I did test some of them, and it works great with people, especially the the one from BBC. <laughs> uh, I did. I can uh, testify for that. Um, so yeah. That, that was the idea of the resource list. And I hope it's going to be useful for people um, who are leaving the conversation today. Thank you, Gulsen. And feel free to contribute. I'm also having a toolkit that I share that's for parents. That's based on the work that we did previously with workshops at uh, My Data for Children. But also I tried to prototype how I'm trying to deal with this with my own son. So I have my home laboratory and I'm trying to navigate and empower him without no clue really what to do. So what I have learned and what it works, I want to share it with you. And I, this is a first prototype, so feedback is welcome. These two materials are for you to use, so hopefully they are helpful. And we have to close now because they're already through. But thank you so much, everyone. Thank you and uh, uh, for creating Mixit. And uh, we look forward to see Mixit in 2025 taking over all the others that are not good. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paula. Thank Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.